When I was asked to put this presentation together for you guys, uh, for you here today, I kind of sat down and thought to myself, it's a, what do I want to get out of a presentation and what do I want you guys to get out of the presentation? Unfortunately, I, I can't provide you with the, the solution or cure to bovine respiratory disease. I'd probably be doing all right if I could do that, but um, I guess the goal of this is to, to make you guys think and challenge you uh, on how you tackle and how you try to solve the problems of bovine respiratory, respiratory disease on your farms. Um, it's a pretty expansive topic and I could definitely take more than just the 30 minute time slot here to, to cover it. However, we have a, there's a lot of challenges that come along with it and one of the things I guess that I want you by the end of this is working with your veterinarians, your industry partners, allows you to come overcome those challenges and make, <coughs> challenges of bovine respiratory disease and make it more, your, your farm more efficient and definitely more, more productive. As you all know, our industry is under an intense amount of pressure um, from everything from animal rights activists like Mercy for Animals to lab-grown meat uh, portraying the environmental causes to our friendly fat man on the A&W commercials that likes to promote or say the use of technology is bad in our food systems. Some weeks and years kind of feel like you never can get, it's pretty tough to get ahead and you can never really catch a break. Thankfully, when it comes to bovine respiratory disease, there's a lot of industry partners involved <clears throat> and a lot of those factors that are out of your control in many aspects of your production are within your control when it comes to, when it comes to this disease process. So I wanted you to take just a couple of seconds to think what is your definition of bovine respiratory disease or pneumonia? And I know if I went through this crowd and asked each and every one of you what your definition, definition is, they all wouldn't be the same. I'd probably get a whole lot of definitions of what bovine or pneumonia is or bovine res BRD is. And one of the reasons is that is because we all have different backgrounds. Some of us grew up on cow-calf operations, some of us grew up on dairy farms, some of us grew up in a feedlot, etc. And those symptoms, although they are very similar, they do present themselves in different ways and they all get handled in different ways. If it's single calf treatment or mass medication, we all kind of do things differently. So <clears throat> it's all depending on your background and where you came from is how you identify a sick animal and how you treat a sick animal and what you do to change that from year to year. Do we always do the same thing or do we do different things going forward? It'd be really nice if it was this easy to pick out a sick calf or a sick cow. However, that's not always true. So when it comes to the textbook definition, a very renowned uh, veterinarian, Otto Radistitz, def defines pneumonia as the inflammation of the pulmonary parenchyma, usually accompanied by the inflammation of the bronchioles and often with bi <coughs> bipleuritis. Not really a useful definition for the every everyday use. However, <coughs> undifferentiated bovine respiratory disease or <coughs> is an acute respiratory disease of an uncertain diagnosis that affects one or more cattle in a group. And what you guys see in the field or in the feedlot is increased breathing. Often you see coughing with that. You can obviously see varying degrees of depression. <coughs> you either see inhabitants and anorexia, not wanting to come up to the bunk to eat, runny nose, fever. And then when you get out of the stethoscope, <coughs> you got to see increased uh, lung sounds. And then you'll obviously have varying responses to treatment. So when it comes to cattle, we always think, are they the only animals that get sick? Only animals that get pneumonia? Horses often don't often get pneumonia. One of the big reasons for this is that the anatomy of the animal. Although, if it was a car manufacturer, we'd probably do a little recall here. This rumen takes up a whole lot of room in that, <coughs> in that abdomen of that animal. It squishes the lungs out and gives the lungs very little space. Therefore, when you have a small amount of that lung, infected by pneumonia or compromised and not able to transfer oxygen back and forth, you have <coughs> increased severity of symptoms. Unlike a horse that has a great big massive lung field, hence why they're also much better athletes. So when it comes to pneumonia, how does it all start? Where does it begin? It usually starts with stress. Often if you're a cow-calf operator, you'll see more sick calves after a severe winter storm. Obviously when it comes to um, filling a feedlot, commingling those cattle, cattle often they're often trucked from long distances, all adds to stress. This gives a chance for your key respiratory viruses to take hold. Either, and when those take hold, it opens up a chance for a bacterial infection 
to come within it or to, to make its way down the lungs as well. The viral is not always a component, but it's often there as well. So Mannheim hemolytica is one of the main bugs, but you also have mycoplasm, pastorella, histophilus somni, and a couple others in there as well. It's a pretty multifactorial system that we deal with, and that's one of the most difficult things and why we just haven't had a straight out solution for BRD. Many factors come into play. We have the calf itself. Is it young, younger? Was it young, we just weaned? The stress that's gone under? How was the nutrition throughout the summer for that calf going into the feedlot? Was there a lot of grass around? Was there a lot of milk from the mom? The immune system can be compromised depending on the nutrition status. We have the environmental factors. Obviously, we get late spring storms, the climate, we have the air. We also have the management within the barn. <clears throat> Do we forget to open the doors last night? Do we let them out at night? Is it hot and stuffy in the barn? All those things. And then we have the pathogens that come into play, the bacteria, the viruses, and then also the toxins as well. These three components all mixing together can either keep a calf healthy, depending on how the balance is, or you can get a perfect storm and you can get respiratory disease that, that takes hold. So what is within our control? The health status of the herd is one of the things. The vaccine status of the individual animals and also the herd. Obviously, more often than not, a vaccinated herd is much more <coughs> immune to infection than a non-vaccinated herd, depending if there's exposure of disease to bugs and pathogens. The nutrition. Calves that are, have a good body condition score, and cows as well, have a big, good body condition score <coughs> and have a properly balanced diet, are much more likely to respond to those vaccines and create an immune response that causes, gives a protection going forward. Then you also have the stress factors. Although not all stressful fa stress factors are within our control, we do have some. The environment, barn ventilation, the overcrowding in a pen or overcrowding in a feedlot, and then the disease challenges. Do we clean that pen out? That kind of stuff. Do we co-mingle cows, calves from different, different herds? Is there a way to reduce that? And then ones that really come in are properly handling methods. Are we being calm and control? Is there a worker or somebody that is a little prone to get on the stock prod from here to the, here or there? Or just maybe is a, gets a little too excited when handling cattle and not working in a controlled method that allows that cattle to stay calm, moving it in the direction that you want it to do and going forward. Pain control. When doing painful, painful procedures, uh, pain control is important. Castration, dehorning, that kind of stuff. Um, the use of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory um, is one of the big things that's definitely coming more and more in recent years, and it's a good thing. We're seeing the benefits of that outside of our control. We have the environment with the weather. Obviously, we can't, the up and down fluctuations, the humidity in the summer, those are things that we have no control over. The age of the calf and the weaning, when it was weaned. Obviously, if it comes to feedlots, if those calves have experienced, uh, had previous lung disease or pneumonia on pasture, we can't help that. It does often impact what, it, what that, calf will, or that calf will do when it comes into the feedlot, but those are things that are outside of control. Also transportation. Obviously when you're filling feedlots and, and, and stalkers are being transported from the west to Ontario, not everything's bought locally, they spend a lot of time on, the, on those trucks. Obviously they take breaks, but there's, when you come across the prairies, especially in the fall, there's a lot of weather changes, dust, chemical irritants, there's all kinds of things that irritate those, those calves that have a negative impact and cause stress that we don't, sometimes don't always account for. So when you take a step back and you're like, well, I can't control a lot of those things, so what should I focus on? Focusing on what you can control will help minimize the negative impacts of what you cannot control. And that's the herd nutrition, the vaccine status, and those kind of things. So <clears throat> this is kind of where I want to challenge you guys and, and ask you guys, how good are you guys at diagnosing BRD? Do you think you catch 90% of the cases on your farm? Do you think you catch 50% of the cases on your farm? 10%? Any guesses out there? Okay. We'll go with, say, 50%. That's usually kind of what the rough number on the crowds that, that go. Next question is, you, how do you diagnose a sick calf or a sick stalker or anything like that? Are you one of those people that can just look at a calf, know that it's starting to kind of go downhill, maybe it didn't approach... You, you keep an eye on it, you know when it comes up to the bunk exactly when you feed, etc. Do you use the kind of that look? Do you monitor the feed intake? 
Sometimes there's even a thermometer in a pocket. Throw them in the chute, take a temperature. Some often have a stethoscope. There's all kinds of ways. I guess one of the next things on yours, <clears throat> for me to ask you guys is, does everyone on your farm diagnose BRD the same way? So that one week in a year that you take off and go away, person filling in for you, do they diagnose BRD the same way that you do? Or is there multiple workers on the, on the farm and you guys all diagnose BRD the same? Some, some places might even have standard operating procedures set up with, to do with BRD <coughs> for yourself or your employees. And this is one way to get consistency throughout your operation to allow, <coughs> to allow the proper diagnosis and proper treatment of BRD as you go forward. So in doing this, I had a pretty interesting, um, I came across a pretty interesting study. Um, this was done on a, a feedlot in, a, <coughs> in the States. And these per, this feedlot was, uh, was actually over three feedlots, had about 6,000 head on the, in total that were taken from on arrival to, to slaughter. And they tracked all the health records for the animals. And these pen riders that went through this, these feedlots or these feed, feedlot pens every day are highly trained. They are some of the best highly managed and some of the best employees that these farms had. So what they did at the end of the study is they, after slaughter, they looked at the lungs and looked for lesions. And they, the, the pen riders assumed that they caught about 60 to 70% of all the sick animals, assuming that that was a, and that would be a, a pretty, good, pretty good start. Um, so out of those 5,000 head, eight, a little over 8% were treated for, for BRD were pulled from those pens and treated with something. So they assumed that they're, if they had 60, 60 or 70 percent were right, they were looking at a 13 or 14 percent chance of having lung lesions. At slaughter, 60 percent of those lung lesions, or 60 percent of those calves slaughtered had lung lesions. These lesions, <coughs> a score of zero, meant there was no lesions at all, and one through five is kind of increased severity of grade. One would be pretty tough to pick out for uh, on, a, on a calf. It most likely was subclinical, wouldn't show severe signs, would probably still be on feed, might have had a minor temperature. However, if you reduce, take away zero and one, which is a big chunk, we still have over, almost close to 40% there, or 35% um, of animals that were, that had either subclinical or clinical signs that were shown. Only eight and a half percent of animals were treated. So we're still missing even these pen riders that are highly experienced and very good at their jobs miss a large portion of the animals that were actually sick or that showed lung lesions. Now some of these lung lesions might have happened when these were cal like calves and had a pneumonia, spring fever pneumonia or something like that. But at the same time, <clears throat> when we use the look or we use a th thermometer or anything, we still have to realize that we're missing a lot of these cattle that are, that are sick. These animals are prey animals, they're not predator animals. They're very good at hiding disease. We have to take a step back and realize that we're not nearly as good at diagnosing BRD as we think we are. And that's one of the challenges that we face as an industry. In the feedlot, North America feedlots alone, BRD costs our industry about a billion dollars a year, just roughly. That's a huge impact on our industry, on cattle, <coughs> on operators' pocketbooks, but it's also a huge impact on our customers as well and consumers. It increases the price of meat. As that goes up, as we well know, the consumption goes down. Those are all things we have to get think about. We have to become more and more efficient at diagnosing and also properly treating BRD. So how do we diagnose the and, uh, BRD and treat it accordingly? Unfortunately, I don't have all the answers for that as well, but one of the things we have to think about is what are the pathogens that are on our farm? What do we see the most? If you're a cow-calf operator, often you'll have more consistent pathogens than possibly a, a feedlot operator. Usually those cows in your herd have immune buildup and those calves are less immune to those pathogens that are carried within your, your, popula in your herd's population. So do you deal with a bacterial issue <coughs> or, population, or a population? Do you have Manheimia or, or pastoral maltosa that kind of live within your herd at a, a level that's not affecting your cows, but might be affecting your calves. Do you have viral challenges? Do we test for BVD? 
you have a PI animal that's running around that's having a negative impact on your herd. IBR breaks or BRSV. These are all things we have to take into consideration and talk to your veterinarians about and making sure we have our um, on, on top of our game in terms of this. So when it comes to diagnosing and the tools that we can use, there are some out there that are, that are economical and there's some that aren't economical. Obviously, if you have a sick animal, um, you want to pull that animal and treat it somehow. Either if you, you pull it, you, you rope it, or you, you put it into the chute and treat. <clears throat> when you're doing this, there's a, you're handling that animal already. If the animal hasn't been treated yet, it's a great opportunity to kind of see what bacteria that are there. Working with your veterinarians to, to kind of take some swabs. If you have a couple sick animals at the beginning, you can identify what they have or what they're, uh, what's causing that sickness. And knowing that or knowing what those, uh, <coughs> what bacteria or what viruses are causing that allow you to kind of tailor your, your treatments moving forward. Now, sometimes you only have one and you take a swab and it's not actually that beneficial. However, when it comes to outbreaks, it allows you to jump ahead of the game and often kind of reduce the, the overall morbidity or the number of animals that are sick as we go forward. So there's two ways to do this. There's the transtracheal aspirations, which is the gold standard, but it's more of a research-based technique. And then there's deep, deep nasal swabs. And what a deep nasal swab is, is that the animal's head gets held. You, it's like a really long Q-tip that goes in. You rub it around, you pull it out, you put it in a container, and you, you send it off and see what's grown. The panels can be done for about $35, and I know that is not a, not a cheap option, but working with your veterinary clinic and you can always freeze those samples and see what happens and kind of going forward, it gives you an idea. What happens when you get the culture and sensitivity of this is that if you use a, a deep nasal swab, you bring out, you find Mannheimia hemolytica or Pastorella maltosa bacteria or you find a virus in there, you can know what to go with. Instead of treating everybody with one drug, you might find out that the culture and sensitivity, you realize that it's resistant to a macrolide or a Draxner or a Mycotil and it's resistant to those and you can just use an Oxyvet or maybe it's re resistant to Oxyvet and you can go with something else. What it does, it, it allows you to, to treat with an appropriate drug at the appropriate time and have a much, much more efficient treatment than you would otherwise. The next thing as well is post-mortem diagnosis. I know there's nothing that can bring obviously that calf back to life, but sometimes having a post-mortem done gives you a lot of information. You can <coughs> Call your vet out or you can open up the calf yourself uh, under the guidance of a veterinarian, take some pictures and send it to them and they can kind of look at it. You can also take some lung samples, freeze them and send them off to the clinic and see as well. There's lots of ways to get information out of the bugs that are causing issues on your farm and use this information accordingly. So when it comes to treating bovine respiratory disease, I know Standard operating procedures, they sound awful and they are awful. It is paperwork and they don't have to be formal written documents and they don't have to be fancy, but it's about getting everybody on one page and it's about consistent evaluation of the cattle that are on your farm and it's about consistent treatment of sick cattle that are on your farm. And in my opinion, one of the most things, it's judicial use, uh, judicial use of antibiotics and proper use of antibiotics and not just, I'm going to treat it with this one and then I'm going to treat it with the next one and then I'm just going to go to the bigger and the bigger and the bigger gun. Or what's even worse sometimes is pulling that big gun off the shelf, big gun being a strong antibiotic, when you can actually use a smaller or a lower strength antibiotic to do the exact same job by treating them accordingly. So when you combine the information that you gather from sick animals, and then it, increase the, it increases your likelihood of, the, of identifying a calf that is sick because you know the symptoms that it shows. Obviously, a BVD animal with BVD or a PI, persistently infected animal, is different than an animal that's going to show an IBR. Or a bacterial infection is going to sh like have different symptoms than a, than a viral infection. And yes, you do get co-infections, but it allows you to learn kind of those pathogens that are on your farm, especially in cow-calf operators, and allows you to kind of to to give you one step ahead of it. And it doesn't take a lot of extra work. It just working smarter, not always harder. So. The next thing is keeping records. How many keep records here? Hands up. How many go back and review those records? And it goes back down. That's one of the things. We're really good about writing this stuff down, and I'm horrible for it as well. You write it down, and you say you treat it with this, but you don't follow it up with treat it with this, and it was successful. 
So instead of, <coughs> this is, keeping records is one of the easiest ways to know if what you're doing is actually working. If you go through and you treat everything as, <coughs> or treat 10 animals, at the end of the year, you're like, oh, you used a bot one bottle of new floor. Okay, did those 10 treatments work? Were they successful? Did those animals go back to the dead pile after? Or did they go on and flourish and catch up with the rest of the herd? These are things that we need to look. So kind of at this slower time of the year when we have a, a nice day like this, going back and looking through your treatment records, and it also requires recording if that treatment worked or not, or if you had to treat it again. And those are things that we need to start doing. If it's in the pocketbook, if it's on a computer, if it's anywhere. Obviously, it's a little easier to, to go back and review if it's on a computer, but it's what's gonna work for you. If it's in your book and you, and you have that book and you're not like me and you don't lose that, then, you, then you're good to go. But you need to take the time to sit down and be diligent about saying, hey, I treated this at 10, six of them were successful, four of them weren't. Okay, well those four treatments that you just did, could I have done something different? What was I treating? What did I do wrong? And that's one of the things that's easy, and it's, it's working with your veterinarian, and sometimes it's a phone call with your veterinarian, or if he's already out there, just kind of picking his or her brain to allow you to, to make yourself more efficient, rather than kind of continuing around the cycle that we're on. So I guess this is the, I've already kind of preluded to this, but have you ever treated a calf that didn't, re, didn't respond to treatment? I'm assuming everybody's treated a calf that didn't respond to treatment. I know I've treated a lot of calves that didn't respond. And what did you do next? Yeah, that's, <laughs> it usually doesn't go well for the animal, let's just say that. <clears throat> However, one of the biggest challenges that we face going forward as an industry is the fact that the antibiotics that we're using and the, and the bacteria are getting to know each other too well. The bacteria are becoming resistant to the antibiotics. It's not widespread, but it definitely is starting to happen more and more. This is a study that was done here in Canada, and these are the red lines, I know it's probably a little tough to see, the red lines that are, um, are sick animals that uh, the, they did deep nasal swabs on, kind of cultured the, that bacteria out of it, but they also took a whole bunch of healthy animals as well and did the same thing. As we go across, zero, one, two, three, four, those are the number of, the bacteria, number of antibiotics that these bacteria are resistant to at the dose that is on the label. This terrifies me, I won't lie. As we become more and more reliant on stronger antibiotics, they begin to, the shine kind of wears off them. Maybe they don't work quite as well, but we still go back to it. This resistant bacteria learn very quickly. It's one of these things that you, one year you might use one or the, the antibiotic and it works great on, a, say you use an on arrival treatment, you have no issues whatsoever. The next year, you might have issues. And it fluctuates back and forth at the very beginning. But eventually that resistance starts to build. Those bacteria populations grow, they get spread across, they learn from each other, and it doesn't take long before we're going like this. I don't know what to do. We have to take a step back, look what antibiotics we're using, and look at the management factors and management decisions that we make to make sure that this community can be here in 50 years and still have antibiotics to use to keep the calves healthy. So, I know I'm gonna harp on this a little more, but I guess it's not just for us, but it's also, it's not just for the cattle, but it's also for us. I know at some point I'm gonna need surgery in my life. I don't wanna go in that knowing that, and I'm getting some looks in the crowd, but if you ski or if you hike, if you're accident prone like me, I'm most likely gonna have to have a bone fixed or anything like that. It doesn't take much. There's enough <coughs> health issues in the world that our industry, the medical industry relies on those antibiotics being able to control the bacteria because we can't do everything in a completely sterile environment. A simple surgery goes into a complicated surgery when you get a, a bacteria. And nobody wants to see a dead animal, but when you have a loved one that goes in for surgery and it becomes more risky as the years go on. It's something that we have to think as a population as a whole, right? These are, this isn't just a small topic, it's a very big topic. And I don't wanna get into it today, but we have to do our part, as, in the, as the beef industry, we have to do our part to make sure we're using what comes in those bottles that we think is a miracle, miracle cure 
properly and making sure we can have that in 10 and 15 years time to continue to do that. So we need to conserve the efficacy of these, these antibiotics. We need to maximize animal health and welfare and help minimize bacterial resistance. And knowing what pathogens you have and what they're sensitive to and what they're resistant to is one of those steps that we have to take to moving forward to understand this. Some of these are shared drug classes that we use with humans and obviously as the new regulations come in place, there's gonna be a little tighter control on these classes of drugs. And I know it's gonna be a little more paperwork for veterinarians and for producers, but it's a step in the right direction and it's a step in the right direction. We need it to, we need it to happen and we're, we're almost being reactive rather than proactive on the matter. So, so we need to know that we're choosing the right antibiotic for the right pathogens. <clears throat> so when it comes to knowing your pathogens, we increase, <clears throat> when you do know your pathogens and know that your Mannheimia hemolytica is resistant to a macrolide, but it's susceptible to a tetracycline or vice versa, we, knowing this, on that next treatment, we increase the chance of a successful treatment. So last year you had six out of 10 treatments that were successful. Well, maybe in 2017, you'll have nine out of 10 if you know your pathogens going forward. Also knowing early symptoms of the specific infections or diseases that are on your farm help you identify those animals more quickly and more effectively, saving you not only time, it also makes you more efficient. So I know I kind of rambled on there in terms of antibiotic resistance and stuff, and if that doesn't scare you, we'll work on a little bit of a economic impact that hopefully kind of drive the part home as well. So, so when it comes to the economic impact of BRD, we have some direct and we also have indirect losses. The direct losses are obviously like, as this gentleman here said, when you pull the calf out with its four legs in the air, it's a big loss, especially if you paid a hefty price on that calf to put it in your lot or to, to buy that calf. You also have drug costs, you have labor costs, <clears throat> which I put on an indirect because we, as farmers, none of us really ever actually put any time or value on our, on our labor. You have performance effects, performance effects and you have veterinary costs. So what does it cost you? And I don't know if your cow-calf operators or, or, stock, or feedlot operators or have stalkers in the, in the barn, but it has a big negative impact regardless. For cow-calf producers, on average, it's about 20 to 25 pounds less at weaning when you have a calf that has pneumonia versus not pneumonia, not having pneumonia throughout <clears throat> before it's weaned. For drug costs, if you treat an animal, five to $20, depending on the age of the calf and obviously the treatment that you're using. When it comes to labor, it's about cost you about, we'll say 10 bucks. It obviously takes a little longer to get out to the field, pull a sick calf, treat it, than it, than it does just to, to walk up to it and so on and so forth. So it takes a little time. These are all costs on your, on your pocketbook. So if you had a, a 100 head cow-calf operation, and on average, it's between, the average is between six and 14% for BRD is what we see kind of in those cow-calf operators. That's generally across Canada. So a split difference, if you have 10% incidence rate of BRD, if one of those calves dies due to BRD, which is not uncommon, total hit to your bottom line is about 1700 head or $1,700 or $17 per head that you could have gained if you prevented the pneumonia. $1,700 doesn't seem like a lot, but most cow-calf operators are obviously have outside jobs as well. That's two weeks of work off farm. I really don't want to give up two weeks of my life for free because I could have prevented it doing something else and by working and <coughs> changing protocols or just not doing the same thing that we've always done. In the feedlots, we're not gonna put a total on it because that just gets scary at time, times, but your average daily gain is affected. During that kind of that first 60 day period or is it 50 day period, <coughs> a calf with pneumonia or a calf that's treated for BRD gains about 0.37 kilograms per, per, uh, per day less than a calf that doesn't get treated for BRD. Negative overall and picked for a full 165 day feeding period is about 0 0.07 or just shy of 0.1 kilograms per day. Mortality costs on a feedlot, if you're losing them in those first 50 days, not a big deal, but if you're, these lung lesions lead to more metabolic deaths later on in the feeding period, that cost grows and grows and grows. And obviously the drug costs that come along with it. So I guess I want you guys leaving here today either cursing my name or you can realize there's lots of challenges in the industry. 
we can't focus on all the challenges and we can't worry about those people that don't want to eat meat or claim it's bad for the environment. But what we can do is making our industry better and stronger and focus on those factors and those things that we can control. I want you to think about starting to start knowing your pathogens that are common on your operations. Even if it's just one nasal swab that you put in, it's better than none. You get that information. I want you to start keeping records or developing standard operating procedures, kind of tracking how you pro prog progress over the year. Those are all things that are going to make our industry stronger and better. <clears throat> and as a side note, reviewing your vaccine programs when you know your pathogens allows you, <clears throat> allows you to, to tailor your vaccine program. And the big thing is about timing, the timing and knowing what to include in your program are the, are the biggest things for a successful vaccine program. And these are all things we have to, to step back and look at. Just because we did it this way last year and we did it this way for the past 10 years and it worked doesn't mean it's always the right thing. Take a step back and just ask why. And what can I do differently and what can I do better? Maybe there's a lot of things. Maybe there's only one or two things. Regardless, there's always something that we can do to improve our operations and improve the efficiencies. Thank you.